right, welcome back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is the life of the land is in its real estate. We're talking about real estate today with, with Kena Nisley. Hi, Kena. Say hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. I'm, I'm healthy anyway, you know, Great. one day at a time, right? Let's stay that we, way. We live in a time where you worry about it all day long. And that's, and that's one of the reasons we do these shows, so we don't have to think about it during the show. We can just talk about it during the show. Yes. You know? Anyway, uh, so what we have is a very peculiar real estate market right now. Um, we haven't discussed the details uh, in, in the past, but uh, I, I just make a wild guess and say it's as flat as it could possibly be. Am I right? We're still seeing a little bit of movement with those that were already shopping, already pre-approved, in the process of looking. So oh, escrows are still getting opened, um, but we're, now we're going to deal with the backlash of the interest rates have rise drastically over the past two days. Let's talk about that. What has happened with interest rates in the past few days? They've gone up, up, up. So right today, a conventional loan is at 5.1 and a VA wow. is at 4.3. Wow. So we were seeing the twos for about a day. And so what happened is when we saw the twos and the very low interest rates, when they dropped dipped to the lowest in, in years, uh, we had a rush on refis and, and purchases. So the banks became overwhelmed with all these notes, all these loans. What a bank does essentially is they sell off their loans to third parties. Well, the third parties didn't wanna buy the loans because there were so many. So imagine you sell t-shirts and somebody, your t-shirts are $20 each. Somebody comes up and says, I wanna buy 50 t-shirts, but I'm only gonna pay you $10 each. So you do it, right? Because you're gonna sell 50 t-shirts. Well then, one person comes up and you need to make up some money because you just sold 50 t-shirts for $10 less than you expected to each. One person comes up to buy one t-shirt and you say, they're $25. Because you're trying to recoup some money. So that's what's happening right now with the market. The banks are not getting the value of what they need to make up the cost of these loans they've already approved. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to make up the money from the onesie, twosie t-shirt buyers. How, how has that happened and how is that connected with uh, coronavirus? I mean, we knew the uh, Fed was uh, dropping rates to an so, amazing yeah. low degree, like zero or very near zero. So the zero rate was not for a mortgage. We will never see a 0% mortgage. The bank has got to make money. Mm -hmm. um, the zero rate was for short-term loans. It was costing lenders and companies to sh less money to zero percent to borrow money. It wasn't co they weren't passing that on to the mortgage to the home buyers. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll never see a zero percent mortgage rate just because a, a lender is always going to need to make money. Mm -hmm. um, but because it the, it did low, we did expect that it would go up a bit, but it would even back out quickly. <coughs> But now because it, the interest rates dropped, the mortgage interest rates dropped and the lenders had the rush, now we're seeing a, a very high spike and it is definitely not going to come down as quickly as it went up. Mm. Okay, so what does this mean to me? I, let's say I'm, I'm uh, in the market. I, I doubt I would be at this time because nobody knows what's going to happen with the virus. But um, is, this, is this a good time or maybe not a good time to so buy a house? Right now... I think it, it is a good time for a buyer. You may be able to get a great deal because sellers are becoming scared, thinking they're not going to be able to sell their house. Mm -hmm. But with that, because the sellers are getting a little more apprehensive to put their house on the market. So now what we're going to see is even, we've always had low inventory in Hawaii. That's always been a problem. So we may see even lower inventory because the sellers are afraid they're going to get low ball offers so they're holding back so now our inventory is even going to dip further which is then going to make it harder for a buyer to find a home interesting so <clears throat> but let's let's look at it this way though um tourism is down by an extraordinary percent and will stay that way for at least a few weeks and that's optimistic um and you know the economy in general in terms of people with jobs and income that's way down it's going to stay that way for at least a at least a few weeks uh, I, I'm not sure that the uh, you know bailout money from the government uh, uh, or unemployment insurance type payments are are going to help <clears throat> um, to you know to excite the market. 
Um, so I think what we're going to have, what we are having, is a recession. And because Hawaii is a mono economy in tourism, that's going to be a serious recession. Uh, there's going to be nobody around who has the, well, I shouldn't say nobody, but very few people who are going to have the impetus or, or the cash uh, to do a real estate deal. And if that, they don't know it yet, they're going to know it soon, in days or even hours, they're going to know it. So isn't that going to, you know, depress any transactions? So we are seeing um, some of our transactions now because of this virus and because of the, the being lays, layoffs, the fewer flights going in and out. Um, people who are in a transaction now, before they can close a mortgage, the lender asks for your proof of income and your proof of employment. So even if they were approved for a loan 40 days ago, the typical escrow is 45 days. So even if they were approved 40 days ago, when they go to produce that proof, they could have been laid off, their hours could have been cut. I myself have had a buyer had to pull out because she's sure. a Hawaiian Airlines flight attendant and her flights were cut in half. Yeah. She could no longer close a loan. So we are gonna see the impact from, from that. And sellers are looking at, um, they, they wanna know what does this person do for a job? Because they know that's coming, that even though we'll get so close to the finish line of closing and recording, but maybe they've lost their job. Well, if I was looking, I would ask them not only what do they do for a job, but, you know, are they working? Yes. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, they, have they been, mar you know, sidelined? Uh, and furthermore, whether, whether their company is, um, you know, really doing business now or whether it's been sidelined and whether it, it might go bankrupt. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of new risks uh, and the old assumptions uh, they might, might have made before, that, that is that the company would continue in business, uh, that the job would continue at least for the foreseeable future. You can't make those assumptions anymore. <clears throat> and there's nothing you, the broker, uh, or the salesperson in real estate can do about that. You, 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 know, you have to be candid with them. They have to be candid with you. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of deals that don't happen because of that. And if they, assuming I'm right about this, assuming those deals don't happen uh, for one reason or another, um, the, the real estate industry, which is huge, uh, the real estate industry, which, which makes its money on transactions, is going to be another casualty in, in this, in this uh, epidemic, isn't it? Yeah, we could be. I think we will see a dip um, in the Hawaii market. So when the, there was the big crash, um, I was not in real estate when the first real estate crash happened. We did not see the impact in Hawaii that the mainland saw because we are limited in the amount of real estate that we have on island. So that, and we do have military constantly coming in and out. Right now they can't PCS. I'm not sure if orders will be cut in May. So we're gonna probably see a later time that, that the PCSs will happen. Oh, sure, the um, transactions happen with the PCSs. Yes. If everybody's locked in place, then nobody's coming or going. Nobody. <laughs> Therefore, no transactions <laughs> No listings, military. no sales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, very um, interesting. Yeah, but we're not at the point we were when the housing crashed. Uh, the last time. So the last time you got to figure it was hard not to get a mortgage. They were giving everybody mortgages and then those people got in trouble with their mortgages, which then put a bunch of inventory on the market. And so we will not get to, I, I can predict, we'll never get to the point where we have, you know, a year's worth of inventory. Mm -hmm. um, we had an average, I believe I read eight months of inventory at that time, which means buyers have their pick of everything. But the inventory was so overpriced because the, the buyer, the, the sellers had paid so much for their, their property, they were trying to get a lot for their property and the value wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So then we saw the drop in the real estate market. But Hawaii saw a bit of a drop. We did not drop as significantly as we did on the mainland. And areas like Kapolei, Eva, Makakilo, didn't, they weren't impacted at all. Because again, that's where most of the military will when we had sure. the VA caps in place right. with purchase. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, the other thing I, I want to mention is I, you know, when I was, um, I was uh, practicing here and although I was admitted in New York City, I really hadn't practiced there. So I took a trip back to New York and I was, I was sitting in on a closing and uh, in New York City, in Manhattan, or was it Brooklyn, whatever. Uh, and, and around the table, there were like 10 people and this was, a, you know, a residence. And I said, well, that's really interesting. That's not at all like Hawaii. 
they were all physically present. And you never knew whether the deal would close um, until all the you know, points and tricks and surprises were ironed out at that table. <clears throat> it was like amazing what people would come up with. Uh, a closing was really an experience. It was almost like litigation, people making demands at the last minute, whatnot. Um, but here, it's all lined up in advance. Yes. The, uh, there's an escrow officer who you may never meet, <laughs> right? Yeah. And all the uh, recordings, they're all automated, and the escrow officer will never meet the people who take the recordings. Um, and the brokers, you know, they may or may not meet. Maybe they will never meet in the course of the whole transaction because it's all paper, it's all email, it's, uh, and it's like you don't, ha you don't really have to have a lot of meetings. It's all you know, offer and acceptance and, and uh, application and submission and whatnot. And I think it's more the case now than it was even in the days of my trip to Brooklyn. So <clears throat> that actually militates in favor of doing deals here instead of doing them elsewhere because we have learned, we are a real estate savvy uh, community and economy. We have learned to do this all by remote. And it's not hard you know, to make that completely remote in the face of the virus, don't you think? It, it is. Um, so there are negotiations that do go on between the agents. So I've spent my morning negotiating a closing that we're supposed to have next week. So the negotiations all take place, place prior to closing. Um, and the, the agents negotiate that out, usually over the phone, via email. Um, you build some strong relationships doing that, as long as you're nice about your negotiations. Um, so that is all done prior. And then the sellers will go sign documents. They can sign with a mobile notary. Everything needs to be done. They don't have to even meet the escrow officer. They don't even have to meet the escrow officer. The notary can show up. Um, buyers can do the same thing. So they don't actually necessarily meet. I never actually physically meet the buyers of most of my listings. Um, my, I don't meet the sellers of, of most of the, the transactions where I represent the buyer. Um, on the escrow note and on, on the Bureau of Conveyance note, there is a fear that the Bureau of Conveyance will close. Now, without the Bureau of Conveyance, you cannot record a deed. You ah, can't close ah, a transaction. Ah, and without closing, you can't pass the keys. The agents don't get paid. Uh, so some title companies have reached out and let me know that they will be issuing title insurance so we can still close our transactions. Um, they will issue the insurance that, yes, if the Bureau of Conveyance, it's not closed yet, if it shuts down, the title companies will issue the insurance to assure that everybody will be paid. So we're, we're not seeing that, wow, we can't close anything. We can't sell any real estate, depending on how long this goes on. Yeah, I can see that happening. <clears throat> the money is in the bank. It's easy enough to verify that, that it's really there. Uh, the escrow officer can do that. All the documents have been signed, probably remotely, you know, in a notary's office uh, somewhere else, uh, not even in downtown. And the escrow officer has those documents in her hands or his hands. Um, and so they can verify that. They can make sure that all the, all, the, all the documents are in order. Everything is finished, signed, and sealed as it needs to be. Uh, and then they can see, they can say, oh, this is ready to close. This is a matter of uh, just sending it down with a messenger um, to the Bureau of Conveyances and, uh, and, re and handing it to a clerk. And it's like, you know, 100% certain uh, if the escrow, the escrow, escrow officer knows as much as the clerk does or more, um, that the escrow officer will be able to say with, with, a, with a certain guarantee that, yes, this will be accepted for recording um, and it will close. And then, of course, you have title people within the escrow company or associated with the escrow company who are actually like working for the title insurance company. Yeah. And they can say, yeah, this this will work. This will close, no problem. So even if, as you say, the government closes down on this, which is really too bad, <clears throat> I'm not sure that it has to happen. The government closes down on this. We can be assured that when the government reopens, uh, it will in fact do a legal recordation and closing. And yes. in that case, the title insurance company, which is motivated to try to close the deal and get paid the title insurance premium, would be willing to say, yes, okay, we'll go on the basis of representations uh, from our a title agent in Honolulu, 
our escrow agent, escrow company in Honolulu, uh, and we're satisfied that all the conditions have been met for a closing. We will close. We'll treat it as closed. And we'll guarantee that it'll close. So, yes, you can pass the keys. That's really interesting. Good for them for thinking of that. Yeah, I, I really thought that was a, a good thing for them to do. Because I did have, I work with a lot of investors, and I actually had a couple investors reach out, concerned, well, what happens if the Bureau of Conveyance closes? So I, I was happy to see that title stepped up and was like, we got you. Well, we have to, you, you know, that's the thing. Um, everybody, you know, treats this crisis as a crisis in which they're doing their public civic duty by staying out of crowds and staying out of, you know, out of circulation. Uh, but that doesn't mean we have to stop doing things. I mean, people who work remotely uh, can continue to work, should continue to work. That's their contribution yeah. to the economy, not just take a nap all day. Uh, I, I, mean, I worry about the, the fact that a lot of people don't see it that way. Just take a nap, not do anything, oh. watch, <laughs> watch the television, see all the programs about uh, coronavirus. But in fact, we can have an economy. We can have a real estate economy. All we got to do is attract sellers and buyers. Yes. Which takes me to the question of, you know, we have a lot of, um, you know, Asian buyers these days who buy very expensive condos. Um, you know, where, I mean, two million sounds like the low end already these days. It uh, is. There was one that went in Kakaako for ninety-five million. Uh. And I'm sure I'm, you know, I may be behind the, you know, the, behind the curve on that. There may be ones that went for more than that, really, really fabulous condos that are not necessarily going to be occupied uh, by very fabulously wealthy Asian buyers. So how is that market being affected? How do they see Hawaii these days as a place to have their retreat condo for multi, multi millions of dollars? So if they are buying at that price point, and you are correct, most of them sit unoccupied. Um, it's an investment. It's not a place to live. So if, if they are at that price point, I believe they will still buy. But the Senate just, pa or just passed the Senate. It's not a law yet that they are going to outlaw foreign buyers from purchasing any properties in Hawaii over five years old. It means they can still purchase the brand new bills in Kakako, but they can't come in and buy some of these luxury homes on Diamond Head um, be, if it passes. Right now, okay. it's only gone through the Senate. Okay. Um, so that is going to impact. If that law passes, it's definitely going to impact. Okay, well, I want to take a market. short break because I'm reeling to hear about that. And uh, I would like to discuss with you the public policy considerations and the real estate industry considerations and the market considerations of a law like that. We'll be right back uh, with Keenan Isley right after this break. Yeah, this is so interesting, Keena. We, we, we need to discuss this on a regular basis. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, we're, we're considering this an ongoing show. It's um, the life of the land is uh, in real estate, and it is in Hawaii in real estate. Although tourism is the number one contributor to the economy, real estate is right behind it. And we have a huge juggernaut industry of uh, real estate brokers and agents and lenders and and lender agents and escrow companies and title companies and lawyers and you know like, and, and inspectors right Inspector yeah it, it, inspectors. it's a big market here it's a big in market Hawaii. a lot of people earn their living from it um, so we, we can't we can't uh, you know forget about it and we certainly don't want to see it uh, shrink and go away because it has been responsible for substantial contributions over the years to our economy on the other hand there are people who feel you know that um, uh, gee whiz. Um, we don't want uh, foreign buyers uh, coming to our shores because they escalate, uh, you know, the values and the, the appraisals, and it makes it harder for local buyers. So I guess somebody thought up uh, this this hard money bill. Can you talk about it? it? It was in the legislature until the legislature stopped, uh, so stopped the session. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. So the, that was the foreign buyers, limiting them from buying any properties that are older than five years old. Um, they don't want the foreign money coming in and buying the luxury properties, the, the, the Kailua's, the Diamond Heads. Um, but being that they only have to be five years old or older, they can still buy the new builds in Kaka'ako. Any new builds, the, the law states right now that they could still purchase. If it passes, it has not gone into law, it's only passed the Senate. But that will definitely impact our luxury market when you're, if you take out luxury buyers from foreign countries. Because um, they are the ones that are buying up those $16 million beach fronts, the $36 million condos. Um, they're the ones purchasing those. Um, so we'll definitely see an impact if that law does pass. Do you think it's constitutional? I mean, there, there, there's a, you know, you say, when you say foreign buyers, how do you define that? I, I try to stay very non-political, and I will represent anyone, foreign or not foreign. What we, we also see foreign buyers and sellers, or they, they started to try to live with them by having them play the harp to fart the 7% withholding tax. Um, and that didn't deter them. So now they're, they're trying, it's not me, <laughs> trying to keep them um, yeah, I, from being able to purchase. I think the Constitution is a limiting factor on yeah. anything that separates uh, local people, uh, local buyers or sellers yeah. from I try from to stay product. neutral. I'll work with uh, you. Or, or from tax, you know, <laughs> yeah. in the same way. So, um, you know, that's, that's actually, the bill is troubling at, at the one hand, and on the other hand, it, it sounds like a legitimate attempt to hold values down. It does. Um, so that you know people local people can buy because yeah. right now we have a we have a market particularly in kaka'ako which is way beyond i say right now i mean up till the virus uh we have had a market that are way beyond the means of the average person i mean who do you know could afford a 95 million dollar condo you know the rule of one percent you know where you're expected to spend one percent of the total price every month so that would be, let me, let me get that right. 1% of $95 million is $950,000. You know, imagine getting your, you know, your, your bill for the common area maintenance and the mortgage and what have you amounting to $950 every, they say $950,000 every month. So, um, you know, isn't it, isn't it good for public policy to try to limit the values as they are inflated by these uh, foreign transactions? It is. It would keep the property in the hands of the people here, um, which, yes, I, I do think is important. I, I'm not against foreign buyers, but I would like to see nothing breaks my heart more than to have a local person not be able to live in Hawaii. And I've had that happen many times where I've had to sell properties because they just can't afford to stay here. Um, I recently had one that, that moved here nine months ago, bought a property, um, and it's now an escrow because she couldn't afford to stay here. Um, she's, she's making money on it. We got it at a great deal. The market is still strong enough that we got her uh, offer over asking. Um, and, and she's actually going to leave after nine months with money in her pocket, which had it stayed in the, in, in the market, she yeah. would have lost money. So, um, but I, I would like something like that. I think it might be a little extreme. I'm trying to stay um, neutral <laughs> so I don't offend anyone. But yeah, I, I mean, if I had my druthers, I would much prefer that local people and people who live here and contribute to our economy and are here on a full-time basis, um, shopping, um, going to the movies, giving money back to our economy, be the ones. If they buy. live here. If they live here. Yeah, that, that, yeah. That's always a valid distinction, whether you're a resident owner or you, you know, don't live here and, and don't, don't reside in the property. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, pro so many properties are coming up where nobody ever lives there. I know, and it's not feeding our economy. No, no, they're not participating. They're not contributing in any way to the average ebb and flow of our economy. So, uh, you know, so you've been involved in this for a few years, and I wonder uh, how it's changed in your, in your time, because I think, you know, that the people, the, the wave of brokers and salesmen, uh, the wave of escrow officers and agents and what have you changes as the uh, Hawaii economy changes and as the practice of real estate changes. How has it changed for you? You sound like an old timer. You know? Well, I've been um, in real estate for four years. Uh, I have seen a lot more new agents come on um, to our brokerage, to all brokerages. You know, it pops up, you know, oh, so-and-so has a real estate license. I got my real estate license. 
they come in thinking this is easy money, um, it's an easy job. This is not. I was a seventh grade math and science teacher. This job is harder. Um, but if you can believe it, I love this job because I love helping people. I love explaining things. I'm very patient. It. I love people. Uh, but this is not. So we have seen an increase in real estate agents thinking they're going to come in and they're going to make some money because the market's so hot. But those are the same agents that, as the market dips, they're going to drop. They can't withstand. Yeah. They can't sustain themselves. A lot more mortgage brokers because again. As the interest rates dropped, more people were getting loans. So it was an opportunity for them to make some quick money. But again, as if these interest rates stay in the fives, we're going to see a lot less people. Well, I want to loans. drill down on that. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the purpose of our show is to examine the effects of the coronavirus on the real estate market and thus the real estate industry, uh, your profession, so to say. And, you know, the question is, uh, looking down, down the pike here, looking for three or six or nine months or a year or 18 months, as they say, for the development of a virus uh, vaccine, <clears throat> it's going to change things. Uh, I mean, our whole world is going to change, Kina. But more specifically, how do you see the real estate industry uh, and specifically the sales part of the real estate industry changing in Hawaii under the stress of um, you know, a down economy for a, a, an indeterminate period of time um, and people who are in the real estate industry having to change their ways over that period of time. How is it going to change for you and your friends going forward? Um, we're going to see, I think, some prices drop um, just to be safe. I, I, again, I work with investors. We're lowering our, our after repair values. So we are going to see, I think, a dip in prices. Um, they really honestly couldn't continue to go up. We needed to maybe bring them back down a little bit. I think bit. we'll lose a lot of brokers and, and salespeople. I think we'll lose um, a lot of agents that don't have the, the one-year savings. So we, I plan for one year out, make sure I have one year to sustain ourselves. Okay, so last question. See. How is it going to resurrect itself? Let's assume it hits a low point and, uh, you know, the, the herd has been culled in terms of the real estate community. Uh, how will we know that it's turned around? How, how will that present itself to you and others, uh, you know, in the community? Um, the sales will, inc will increase, the demand, uh, more buyers than sellers. Um, then you can convince sellers to put their properties on the market. But as the market does increase, we start doing better. We, all those that have their real estate license will come back. Those new people who want to give it a try will go get their license and they'll become mortgage brokers, real estate agents. They'll jump back in when it's good. How about right now? Is, is, it, is it time for an opportunistic buyer to step in and, and make a killing on a deal? Um, Would you recommend is. that? I, I will tell you, I've had some buyers get some amazing deals this week. Uh, I've opened four escrows and a couple of them were amazing deals. One of them was also an offer over asking on a condo. So it's going both ways right now. It's hard to tell. Very interesting. We have to follow this with you, Kina. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And I, I want to see you do other discussions with other people in this show uh, going forward so we can follow what's going ha what's happening in a market that's really exciting. <laughs> Not necessarily good exciting, <laughs> yeah. but exciting. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Aloha.